Hello, Anti-Culture, and welcome back again to my floor. My name is Josiah Sinanin, and I'm the host of the podcast Anti-Culture, which you're about to listen to, Season 5, Episode 2, with Saeed M. Dahoma, better known as Saeed the Pastry Nerd. Saeed has a really great story, and he grew up in Paris, France, to Comorian parents, and then moved to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He is a PhD in neuroscience, but what he's best known for is his decadent French pastries. So... I'm really excited to talk to him about race, culture, and identity, and he drops a bombshell that he thinks that Paris might be a little bit more racist than Alberta, Canada, which was a shocker to me. So you want to make sure you tune in, especially if you're interested in French culture. Every season on the show, we do a French highlight because I used to live in Paris, and it's one of the most fascinating cultures out there when you're looking and talking about cultural identity and even what national identity means. So I'm really happy you're tuning into this episode and I hope you enjoy. Stay tuned for more bonuses. And if you want to check out the rest of the show, you can visit us at josiahpodcast.com and make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Season 5 for Anti-Culture. I'm your host Josiah Sinanin and today's show is an episode that speaks to a tradition we have here on the show and that is highlighting French culture. This next guest of mine was such a special treat for me to interview. He is a French Comorian living right here in Alberta, Canada. That is not something you get to see every day. Saeed M. Dahoma was named Western Canada Foodie of the Year in 2021, and I was so honored to get to speak to him. Saeed was born and raised in Paris, France, and he shares with me the ins and outs of navigating his French culture, his Comorian heritage, and his newfound home here in Canada. Saeed is also a PhD in neuroscience and as a Frenchman, loves to get deep in conversation, so we cover some pretty interesting topics you'll want to make sure you stay tuned for. Plus, we get to talk about all kinds of amazing and delicious French pastries. For those of you who are new to the show, I like to do a French highlight every single season because in 2015 I used to live in Paris and it brought about a bit of a cultural renaissance for me by understanding their concepts of race and identity. And in France, that concept is very strong. So I find stories of people who have either transplanted from France or live there to be fascinating. So I invite you to join me today on my curiosity as I talk to a Parisian who got transplanted here in Calgary. Today's episode of Anticulture is brought to you by Rumi. Cold drafts, flickering lights, and where's that leak coming from? If you've ever wondered what's really going on in your home, Rumi's Ask a Home Inspector service can help. Connect with a certified professional home inspector by phone or video call and get your questions answered. Rumi will let you know what's easily fixable with a little DIY or when you might need to call in some professional help. Visit rumi.ca, that's R-U-M-I dot C-A, and book your Ask a Home Inspector appointment today. ATB Cares is another sponsor of the show this week. With ATB Cares, giving is easy. Donate through ATB Cares and ATB will match 20% of every dollar donated to eligible Albertan charities, maximizing the impact of your donation. Visit atbcares.com to choose your cause and donate today. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy this delicious episode with Saeed M. Dahoma. So Saeed, thank you so much for being on the show. Why don't you give us a quick introduction to get us started? So I would introduce myself as Saeed the Pastry Nerd. I, I'm from France, but also have Comorian background. So I was born and raised in Paris with Comorian parents. So my parents are from a little island in the Indian Ocean called uh, Comoros. And they, they immigrated in Paris in 1986. And I was born at the same year. And I moved in Calgary seven years ago now. And so were you not making French pastries before and you learned after? Yeah, I was not making French pastries before at all because, I, I mean, I was you were, in Paris yeah, you were in and, I could, and, and I didn't have to make anything. I would just go to the bakery and, and buy something. And I only started making French pastries when I moved here in Calgary because even though there are a few pastry shops in Calgary, I just missed the, the variety 
of of uh, pastries and I just wanted to do something a little bit different. Yeah, I love that. And what do you think is kind of the the missing element that makes French pastries so unique? Like why is it so hard to find a true French pastry anywhere else in the world? I think one of at least one of the main reasons will be the ingredients. Uh, French pastries define themselves mostly by the ingredients such as, such as cream and butter. There's a huge culture of butter in France and, that, and it's something that you should not mess with in, with French people. And even though Calgary and Canada is catching up and there's more and more delicious butters here, it's not something that has been imprinted in, I feel like, and I might be wrong, in, in Canadian minds. I think that's what makes French pastry different. And it's also a lot in the culture. Like French people would eat pastries all the time. And that's why they, they have, and there's so much competitions between different bakeries. And because there's so much competition be between different uh, bakeries, so the level of the, of the pastry world just keep going up and up and up. That's what make, maybe makes it different in France compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, that makes sense. And I remember when I was living in France that I just, that's one thing I noticed right away is even just the way the bread tastes, the way, you know, the butter spreads and everything. It's, it's so different than what we have here. And even things like milk and, you know, the produce is so different. There's such a different background culture. So that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm really thankful you're here because I need that taste of France too. I miss it. So I want to ask you, um, we're going to get back a bit more to the baking story, but I do want to ask you a bit more about um, culture and what it means to you. So I want to start with um, talking a little bit more about Paris. And I want to know what it was like for you to grow up in Paris and some things you'd want people to know about Parisian culture. I know there's a lot of stereotypes um, so how would you, how would you approach that? How would you explain what, what Paris is truly like? So I would say if I had to define pa Paris in, in short sentences, I would say first that Parisians are very proud of their city. They really like it. And there's that thing that people call, call joie de vivre, which is basically the fact that Parisians love taking time for a coffee, taking time to have lunch, taking time to have dinner, which is uh, which was quite kind of kind of a culture shock when I moved here and started working here. Like how people don't spend a lot of time having lunch; they just eat a sandwich and leave. <laughs> and whereas whereas in Paris, people sometimes exaggerate and will spend two hours having lunch. But you know, it's it's the kind of thing that makes Parisian Parisians. Um, I also think that. When you think about Paris, it's very crowded and it's very stressful. So for me, moving to Calgary was kind of a relief in that sense. It's a little bit slower. It's a little bit, you know, yeah, slower, I would say. And one thing that is true, though, is that, yes, Parisians tend to be on the rude side. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe because, you're admitting that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I have to. I have to. And it's true. And I do realize that. I, I never realized that until I moved mm. from Paris. Because for me, I mean, I was just a Parisian. And then I moved here in Calgary and people were nice. And, <laughs> and it was weird for me to see people being that so nice. And when I, every time I go back to Paris, I have that reverse culture shock and I'm and I keep thinking, oh, why are people so rude here? Mm. And, and it's always hard to adapt there. But yeah, it's true. It's, it's a cliche, but it's true that Parisians tend to be on the rude side. And, and I don't think it's because they're mean per se. I think it's because life is extremely stressful in Paris and it's extremely difficult to make, uh, to make money, to 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 have a good balance between your to, to have a good work life balance. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's I think kind of what I think there's different perceptions of what that rudeness is because I think for people that are tourists going to Paris, I know that that's something I picked up on pretty quickly. Is 
you know, it's so obvious when there's Americans in the metro because they're so loud. And <laughs> I think that's that's my reverse culture shock is when I was in Paris. I'm like, everyone's so quiet. Like everyone is, you know, they speak softly and there's, you know, everyone kind of minds their own business for the most part. And then you get that group of tourists and they're so loud and it's like, okay, so North American culture is actually kind of obnoxious. <laughs> and so <laughs> I can see where the rudeness comes towards people like us, people like me. But um, it's interesting to hear that from someone who actually is Parisian, um, that it's it's that stress of the big city that can contribute to that attitude as well. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that in if you go a little bit outside of Paris, people are way more chill. Uh, and even if you take a Parisian and you put him in another city, they tend to relax. They tend to be <laughs> a little bit less uh, mean or rude. And again, I don't think that Parisians are rude per se. It's just that they are stressed. And at the same time, if you, if you had a chance, if you get a chance to talk with someone with, from Paris, it's actually quite easy to make friends, to make mm. Parisian friends, I find. Yeah, I found that too. I actually found it's a little bit easier to make new friends without having any prior connections there than here. Um, that's my perspective, but I think it's just people are more open to, you know, you're, you're walking in um, Jardin du Luxembourg and you can just stop and talk to someone or, you know, uh, if you're at the bakery, you can say something to someone. People are like receptive in that way, which I think is really cool. And I think it's maybe part of that joie de vivre that you're talking about is um, there's, there's more time for those things. And something that I think is cool about Paris too is that I find that the people there are very philosophical. Um, and they want to go deep about conversation, which I think is kind of cool that you chose neuroscience. Is that kind of, is that a cultural thing, do you think? Or what drew you to neuroscience? I think it's a French thing, actually. And that was also a cultural shock when I moved here, because I would go very deep, very quickly with people. Yeah. And they will be like with Calgarians, and they will be, you know, looking at me like I was some kind of an alien. And why <laughs> would I go so far? Why, why would I go so deep into conversations right away? And we love to debate. We love to talk about different kind of things as, and to go as deep as possible. And I think that's one thing that characterized us. So neuroscience for me is initially, I, I mean, one of the main reason why I decided to go into neuroscience is because I've always been interested in behavior. So actually, my degree is in behavioral and pharmacological neuroscience. And I, I really like to understand why people behave in a certain way, why people do things the way they do, and when it comes to their behavior and what how does it work in their brain? I, I think it makes me, first, I think it makes me a little bit more patient, patient when it comes to, you know, the way people behave sometimes and sometimes people can act, again, like I said, like the way Parisians are rude. You might think, okay, they're just rude, but there's a reason for that. There's a reason why they act this way. And some, sometimes some people in the street or in or any other setting might be mean, rude, aggressive, and I always try to understand, okay, why are they aggressive? Maybe it's not against me. Maybe something wrong is going in their lives, maybe in their lives, maybe they're not feeling good today. And trying to understand that and, you know, to be patient. And when it, come to, when it comes to pastry, I think it's, um, I think it helps a little bit, or I, I would say a lot when it comes to my social media because understanding why kind of the behavior of people helps me, you know, cater to my audience and give them something that I think they might want, that I think they might be interested in. I want to know if you could tell us a little bit about Comoros and what it means to you um, as a country and maybe just educate us a little bit on um, what Comoros is. So Comoros is uh, northwest of Madagascar, and like you said, it's a tiny, tiny archipelago. So there's four islands, 
and there's they're tiny i'm sure calgary is bigger than at least one of the island and 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 it's super tiny but there's a lot of culture there there's a lot of culture there because it was at a it's at the crucial very important location where the, there was the spice trade there and also lots of different um, produce being imported and exported from there. You have, and Comorian people are a mix of different ethnicities actually. So you had people from South India, you had people from Yemen, you had people from Madagascar who all decided to live there. And that's why Comorian, Comorian language is actually very, uh, it's, it's actually very, um, how do you say that, complex? Because you have influences from Arabic, from uh, Tamil, from Spanish, because they were, and French, obviously, because there was colonization. So it's, it's, so it's a very specific, it's a very specific, I would say, melting pot. And for me, Comoros is, I kind of have, um, I would not say complicated relationship with it, but I would say um, complex relationship because even though my parents were born there, I've only been there a few times. And I've been there maybe four times in my life, five maybe. And I, but even though I've been there just a few times, I have very deep memories of that place. I have deep memories of, of the smell there and I, I mentioned that, but so my grandmother was a vanilla farmer. So for me, like when I associate Comoros with vanilla, I associate Comoros with also cane sugar because my uncle was working with, can, uh, with canned sugar. There's a lot of different produce there that are even because even though I didn't live there, because my parents grew up there, the, all the dishes that they were cooking and baking were Comorian dishes. So when it comes to the culture, to the Comorian culture, most of, most of it, most of the Comorian culture I have in me is food. Wow, yeah. And that's such a big connection to a culture too, which I think is really important to note about your story because it kind of, kind of comes full circle. And I know that you've done some pastries that have some Comorian influence too. Yeah, and I always, I mean, at first... When I started baking, I've all, I was, you know, because I'm French, I'm French and I'm Comorian. So at first I was very focused on the French side of, of things. And I would just do, you know, French pastries and so on. And then after a while, I realized that we have so much ingredients in Comoros mm. that are used like vanilla. Vanilla right. is very, it's very much used in the baking world. And then I started digging, like, what are the Comorian ingredients that I could in, that I could uh, put inside my French baking or Comorian baking and just mix everything together mm. in a way that makes sense. Like, for example, recently I sent a newsletter with a, with a carrot cake. And when I looked at the, the spices using uh, other carrot cake, I was like, oh, I was thinking most of those spices are used in Comoros. Actually. Right. And so I, I used a little bit more of Comorian spices to make some kind of a Comorian carrot cake, a carrot cake that you would make with Comorian spices. That's so cool. I really love that. And so Comoros, you mentioned it has been colonized by the French in its past. Um, is that partly why your parents chose to move to France because they had the language or what's the relationship between those two countries like? Exactly. So a um, few things why my parents decided to move there. First, exactly because of the language, uh, because it was colonized by France and uh, they, my parents went to French school when they were kids, so they, they would speak the language. And there was also, at the time, l labor shortage in France, so France was welcoming as many immigrants as they could so that, you know, the, the economy could still go on and on. Um, could still thrive and the fact is my father decided to move there because he had a bad car incident and to get surgery he needed to go to France and when he moved there he realized that he liked the country and he decided to stay. And would a lot of Comorian people, I, I was just seeing this on your website, 
Comorian people, would a lot of them also identify as East African or is it kind of dependent on... Because I'm just thinking of the location. Do a lot of people consider that East Africa or is that kind of a separate identifier? Well, it depends on who you ask that to. For me, definitely East Africa. Uh, Comoros is, in, is an East African country. There's no way around it. But because of all that melting pot that I mentioned before, uh, some Comorians think that they are such a specific melting pot that they will not necessarily identify as East African. They will ide identify themselves as Comorian and that's it. But for me, Comori Comoros as East are East Africans. And actually, when you look at the culture and you compare it to, for example, the culture in Kenya or Tanzania, it's extremely similar. It's very, very similar. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. It seems like it's such a unique place. Now I want to go there. <laughs> yeah. And if you, I mean, I know it's very far from Calgary, but it's such a beautiful place. And it's such a beautiful place because um, there's not a lot of tourism there yet. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the, the, I mean, it hasn't been inhabited by, by a lot of people. So you have the natural habitat, you have, the, you have all, the, all the animals that are still living there. You, and you still have hotels and it's beautiful. There's almost no pollution. And if you go to, to the ocean to swim, like there's nobody because there's wow. no tourism. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful place. That is amazing. Well, your backup job can be tourism for Comoros. <laughs> 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 I love that. So I do want to kind of ask a little bit more about that because um, something you said was really interesting. Um, your parents obviously had a a deep relationship with France as a country um, for having to go there and being doing school there and then eventually deciding to move there. And I know for a lot of people, um, my dad is from a Caribbean country, from Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I know it's, it's complicated, it's a complicated topic, but there's a lot of people that have um, some animosity towards the countries that colonize them. And I'm thinking actually of an interview I did with an Algerian friend of mine um, who is French as well. And so I know that Algeria and France have quite a complicated relationship, um, especially after Algeria's independence. And so how is that different in Comoros? What's the attitude towards France? Because you've painted a picture that sounds positive, but I'm wondering if there's something more to that. Let's go. Yeah, let's go deep. Okay. Um, I do think that there's so many things that have to be said about it. So when I was a kid, my parents, my parents would, would always tell me, oh, French people are so racist. And I wouldn't understand that because I was actually living in a community with a lot of immigrants from actually Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and I didn't feel it too much. And it's only when I moved to university where there will be, yes, black people such as myself, but there will also be people, from, white people. And, and that's when I understood. That's when I understood how complex it was. And that's when I understood how racism, how, how, how there was a lot of racism uh, amongst French people and how difficult it is. And, and mind you, I mean, I'm, I'm French and I speak French without an accent, but for my parents, it was, it was even worse because they, 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 I mean, they speak a little bit of French, but they spoke it, they still, uh, they speak it with a, with an accent. And France has, um, and Comorians have a very complicated relationship with France because of the colonization, because of how, um, Comorian people are, I mean, black people in general, actually, are sometimes treated in France. And it's sometimes very difficult to navigate this world when you, you're getting racial slurs where you're not treated the same way as other people. And that's something that I definitely felt. And mind you, I actually felt it even more when I moved in Alberta because... I know Alberta is considered as one of the most, uh, I don't know if you can say that, but most racist places in Canada. 
but I find it way less racist than Paris. And and for me, I it's obviously there's racism in Alberta, but but Paris is way more harsher and it's sometimes very difficult and sometimes and that's one of the main reasons why I I love Paris so much but when I think about the way it is in terms of racism there I hesitate when I think about moving back there I hesitate sometimes um even though I love the city I love the country I love the culture but I'm just afraid of how I would be treated because I've been treated treated quite well here. I think something that comes to mind when you're talking about that is just the question of growing up and navigating your identity. Obviously right now there is there's a part of you that's proud to be French and you're you're coming back to the roots of you know what your French side by you know making these pastries and 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 you identify as French Comorian and so was it hard for you to adopt that identifier and say, I am a French person? Um, did you feel, or did you feel like that was easy to accept in yourself? It's actually the opposite. It was easy for me to say I'm French because, and I realized that later on, that in France, if you say that you're not French, that you have another identity, people think that you are not proud of being French. So if you say I'm French Comorian, it's like, oh, are you, do you really feel French? I, do you really feel, feel like you belong? And I always felt like I belong, I, but people, other people felt like I did not. It's very important in France to say, oh, I'm French, I'm French, I'm French, and you have to, to identify yourself as French. So you, so people feel like you belong to to the French family. But being Comorian, I've all, I would always put that to the side. And it's only when I, so when I moved here in Canada, first I realized how French I was because because of my culture, because of the way I behaved, and how I behave differently from other people. So it reinforced it. It reinforced my Frenchness and, and my awareness of my Frenchness. But I also realized that, yes, I'm French, but I'm also Comorian. The, the things I eat, the way I season my, my dishes, the way I season my bakes is very Comorian, the, the things I eat. So, so being Comorian, I, I only became aware of that even more when I moved here and also because I was missing my mother's um, cuisine so much that I realized that how big part of my identity it was being Comorian. It's, it's a huge part of my identity. Yeah, wow. And so you felt more free to add on that hyphenated identity when you were in Canada. Yes. Interesting. Yes. That is fascinating. Yeah, and on top of that, as I moved, as I moved here, so my, my Frenchness was reinforced, my Comorianness was finally assumed, and I got the Canadianness that was added on top yeah. of that, and now I feel like I'm between three cultures. When it comes to Calgarian Canadian culture that I integrated, uh, the, the politeness, the very, very polite people here, saying sorry all the time <laughs> uh, to the point where my Parisian friends, when I see them in France, they always tell me, why do you keep apologizing every two seconds? And, they, and it became a part of myself to, and I also feel like people here tend to be more, uh, tend to be a little bit more um, aware of other people's boundaries and not when it, I mean, whether it's phys physically or, or in terms of, you know, mental space, they would not invade your mental space so much. And yeah, I think that's, that will be how I see it. And what, and that will, that will be things that I would do now uh, on a regular basis.
It's just interesting to hear you even explain the parts of the culture that you've you've pulled out of your experience, which is fascinating. Now, I do want to bring you back to your baking um, as we start to wrap up here. And I wanted to ask you um, a couple questions that are just kind of more fun. So um, the first thing I wanted to talk about briefly is your um, designation as Western Canada's Foodie of the Year, which congratulations on getting that designation. That's uh, pretty amazing, especially because you've only been here for seven years, but you've had this reputation built up. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more about um, what that designation meant and, uh, and what it means for you moving forward? For me, it meant a lot. It meant a lot, especially because I did not do anything to get it. I just received an email one day from someone working at Western Living Magazine telling me, hey, we, you are nominated to be one of the 10, the 10 foodie of the year in Western Canada. And I've been, I've been, you know, working, trying to hone, to hone my craft, baking, uh, baking as much as possible. And I didn't realize that people were watching. I mean, people, I mean, of, of course people were watching, but I didn't realize that people working at magazines were, were watching and were taking notice of what I was doing. And to see, to be recognized among chefs, amazing chefs in, in Western Canada was such an honor to me and I, I just didn't expect it and I'm so proud of having that award. So I keep telling to everyone that I'm proud of it it's, and it's not because I want to rub that on anyone's face, it's just because I'm very proud of it and very proud of, of being recognized in, in Canada, which is my the the country that I live in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Congratulations. And it is really cool. I feel like you've really drawn a lot of attention to what you're doing. And I love how you talked about how your neuroscience kind of plays into that because you're able to craft um, something that's so wonderful to follow along with. Um, And I'll be plugging all of your social media. But um, I know that you recently also developed um, some courses too. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about that and what made you decide to start doing courses? I've always wanted to teach. Uh, that's something that I've, I mean, I've been teaching when I was a scientist, when I was working at, at university. Be, and I've always wanted to, che- to teach because I used to be a really bad baker. I used to be extremely bad. And sometimes when you don't know where to start, it's really hard to to bake something for yourself or for your family. And I thought, hey, what if I teach people to make goods for people they love? And one thing that I really, really like is when, um, so there was a class that I made with someone and, and at the end of the class, some family members came in and started to eat together the cake that my students just made. And just seeing people's face being happy, just seeing people sharing happiness um, on the other side of the screen for me is, is worth it. I really love when people succeed in their baking, who learn new things and can share that among others. Because for me, it's all about baking is also about sharing and sharing is caring. <laughs> so for me, it's all about sharing as much knowledge as possible so that people you know, can, can have a moment where we're just happy to, to share goods with other people. And Said, I want to know what is your favorite pastry to bake and why? Okay, so my favorite pastry to bake is uh, vanilla cream puff. Ooh. It, so I love cream puffs with vanilla pastry cream. I, I love doing that because it's actually, it doesn't take much time actually. You don't need to be, uh, you don't need to be the greatest baker on earth to do that, and it's just. I think I really like them because it's it's creamy, it's crunchy at the same time, and you have that very uh, very decadent cream cream inside, and and also the vanilla part. And for me, the vanilla part is always brings me back to, to Comoros, to my grandmother, and there's always that, that smell that 
gives me, you know, good vibes, good feelings. That's why I really like making that that recipe. And I, I know I have asked you about this on Instagram, but um, have you ever made a Paris breast? Yes, I've made a Paris breast, Paris breast, sorry. <laughs> And this is one of my favorite pastries ever. That's my favorite. Uh, it's made with it's with hazelnut cream and with and cream and cream puff and I really really lo love that pastry. Amazing. Okay, well, that is what I need to have you make for me when we ever meet in person. <laughs> Definitely. Saeed is currently offering French pastry classes online. You can find his availability at thepastrynerd.com slash classes. You can also sign up for his newsletter so you can find the class that suits your interests. Saeed will also be having some pop-up events coming up over the next few months, so you'll want to make sure you subscribe to that newsletter. If you can't wait for a class, you'll definitely want to follow him along on Instagram to see what he's baking. Find him at saeed.pastrynerd. I'm your host, Josiah Sinanin, and thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Anti Culture. You can catch up on all episodes at josiahpodcast.com and follow me on all social media at Josiah Podcast. We have a great season still to come, so make sure you subscribe and spread the word, and we'll see you next week.